scripture this morning comes from Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. At nine o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw some people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work in the vineyard. At noon and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. At five o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again and saw some more people standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. When those hired at five o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more. But they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat? He answered one of them, Friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. It, is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because it, I am kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If we're really honest, for some of us, this scripture sort of bothers us, doesn't it? I mean, if you work really hard and you work all day long, and then someone who only worked five minutes or an hour gets paid the same as you do, how many are like, yeah? How many are like, really? Seriously, why is this person paid the same that I am? That is not right. I mean, most of us would get pretty upset about it. We'd be ready to riot about it. But yet, this is what Jesus says. Now, right before this section in Scripture, Jesus also tells another story about a young, rich ruler who comes up to him and says, you know, I do everything I'm supposed to do. So what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus tells him, go and sell everything you have. And the rich young ruler very sadly leaves. And then the disciples are like, oh, well, wait a minute. So we left everything we had, so we're good, right? We're getting into the kingdom. And Jesus assures them that they will, but he also says this statement of the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And then he tells them this parable that I just read. They're like, whoa, what? And when we hear it too, we're like, what? What do you mean? Shouldn't it all be fair? And many times in our lives when we see people pass us by, you know, maybe in our jobs, and we know that we've worked more hours than they have, and we've, our presentations have been way better than theirs, and then they get the job we wanted, we think, oh, it's unfair. And maybe it was. But today I want you to look at this story a different way. I don't want us to look so much at the people who were hired first, but at the people who were hired last. In the story, Jesus tells of the vineyard owner going back in around 5 o'clock, and there are people there. He says, hey, why aren't you working? And their words are, no one hired us. No one hired us. 
And at first we may think, oh, well, but you know, they probably didn't get hired because they were lazy. They weren't good workers to begin with. That's why they didn't get hired. Or, you know, they probably, you know, they're, they're just, they really didn't want a job. They just probably were walking around and just not really, you know, really pushing. They weren't go-getters. They weren't, you know, they didn't really go for the job. Isn't that our first thought? Don't most of us think the people that were hired last are sort of, they were losers? Come on, be honest. Come on. <laughs> but yet, Jesus tells us a different story. Jesus tells us it's the story that they are worth being hired. Jesus shows that they are worth coming in and working at the vineyard. And not only working there, but being paid a full day's wage. Many times when we see people on street corners with signs, we think they deserve to be there. They must have done something to deserve it. They're, they drank too much. They did drugs. They did this. They didn't work hard enough. And many times we pass judgments and think they weren't worth hiring. Don't we? I read something about this sermon from a professor friend of mine who was actually my professor uh, in seminary who taught preaching. And he talks about looking at the scripture and looking and, and having sort of that point of view. And, but he remembers when he was young, and he's, this preacher has been around for, he's in his upper 80s, and so he was around in the time of the Depression. He remembers walking home one day and seeing his father standing in the kitchen which was a rare sight because he was always out working. And his father, who was a very hard worker, had lost his job. It was a time of depression, and a lot of people who seemed horrible didn't have jobs. And he all of a sudden saw the unhired servant differently. In these times, in the times that Jesus is talking about, people would work in the fields and they would look for jobs, and that day they would wait in the villages for somebody to come hire them. And when people came in and hired, then when, if they were not hired, then you would go to the next village and next village. So it's very likely these unhired servants have been moving from village to village trying to find someone to hire them. But whether they tried or not, they were unhired. I know my view of the unhired servant changed a little bit over a year ago, a year and a half ago. There are many people who work very hard but don't have jobs. I know my mom's a general manager of a TV station. I'm very proud of her. I've been proud of her for a long time. And she was at a TV station in San Antonio, Texas. Very large market. Proud of her working her way up the ladder. Well, her station was bought out over a year and a half ago, probably about two years now. And as things happen, when a big company buys out another big company, all the general managers, what? They lose their jobs, regardless of how well you do or not. And she, like all the other general managers, lost her jobs. And it was December, around Christmas time, not a good time to lose your job. But... I, you know, really when she told me, I wasn't worried about her because I, knew, I know my mom. She's a hard worker. She's a horrible person. And she would have another job waiting for her. Well, sure enough, she got offered another job. And about three weeks later, she was interviewing with them. And they offered her the job. She was signing the paperwork. The interview was over. They, they offered her the job, signing the paperwork. In the midst of the conversation of signing all the paperwork. Something was said, and she, for some reason, shared her age. Now, y'all cannot tell her I told y'all this. <laughs> and we're not going to let her see this podcast. But at the time, she was 63. Shh. So, 
I'm going to get so in trouble when she finds out. So she's now 65. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> just this year, though, just happened in April on Easter, actually. Anyway, <laughs> I thought, might as well push the envelope. She's going to see it. So anyway, so, <laughs> so she told her, and they said, oh, whoa, whoa, we have a mandatory retirement at 65. And they took the job off her back. Now, she was all of a sudden unhirable. Now, yes, she could fight discrimination and all that, but that's not what this is about. The point is, someone who seemed very hireable all of a sudden wasn't hireable because of what? Not because of how, how smart they were, not because of their education, their lack of experience, but because of their age. Nothing that you can change. All of a sudden, when you hear from that angle, you look at the parable and you see the unhired servant, you, it may change how you look at it. Whether the unhired servant really didn't bust a move and work hard enough to get the job, or whether the unhired servant just didn't fit the right age requirement when the landowners came in and wanted to hire people to work their fields, whether, whichever it was, what this parable is trying to tell us, what Jesus is trying to tell us with this story, is not you should get paid a certain way regardless of how much you work. What he's trying to tell you is regardless of who you are. My grace, my love is available to you. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. It's not about being fair or unfair. It's about who God is. How incredible his love and grace is. And that love and grace cannot be taken away from you regardless of who you are, whether you are a homeless person on the streets and maybe you did drink too much or whether you are the richest person in the world it does not matter to God. It may matter to us, but what God is saying, it does not matter to me. I love you regardless. And guess what? The reason I paid them the same is because I see them the same. I do not have the rich person, whoo, they're really special. I have them really close to me. And the poor person's way over here. No, I love all of them. You know, there are many, you know, I've heard sermons over the years, not normally Methodist sermons, but it doesn't matter, that talk about mansions in heaven and stuff. And I think, wow, that sort of sounds cool. I mean, to have a mansion in heaven, who doesn't want a mansion? But really, I don't think there's going to be any mansions in heaven. I don't think there'll be any mansions because I don't think God will have that kind of distinction. Ooh, look, you get a mansion. Ooh, you get a shack. I don't think that's what the kingdom come, heaven, is going to be about. I think we're all basically going to be in a commune together. So you better like one another. <laughs> the good thing is in heaven, we're all going to love each other. We're all going to like everybody. So we won't care that we're in a commune together. It's not about who's better and who's not. We're all, in God's eyes, hireable. We're all desirable. We're all wanted. And even though it may, we may struggle with this scripture and think, oh, but what about the person that was hired first? You know, well, why, as a Christian, should I work so hard to be a good Christian if it doesn't matter if you can be chosen at the last minute? And that's a good discussion. That's a good question to have. And I would say to you, there are a lot of benefits to being a Christian all your life. A lot. You know, if you wait to your deathbed to accept Jesus, you're still going to have eternal life, but you're going to have had a lot of consequences along the way that were very difficult and along the way, you probably didn't have a lot of good Christian people surrounding you with love and grace and mercy and praying for you. Jesus was always there, 
but you probably weren't aware of him being there with you. But as we grow as Christians and as we see the fruit, peace, love, kindness, gentleness come out of us and extended to us by God, there were a lot of good things about being a Christian and working early in the day and being hired early. There were a lot of benefits. A lot of benefits. So it definitely pays to be hired early also. But what Jesus is saying with this is you are no better than the person who comes to the game late. We're all equal. And that's not a bad thing at all. God's love and grace is available to all people. And that's a good thing. And even though it stretches us, you know, love of Jesus is so awesome. I mean, it's incredible, the love of God. But if we're really honest with ourselves, having the love of Jesus in us stretches us. And what I mean by that, if we're really honest, we don't like everybody. Who likes everybody in here? Anybody? And one person back there. Valencia says she likes everybody. Really? Okay. <laughs> okay, Valencia likes everybody. So everybody be friends with Valencia because she likes everybody. You like everybody? Oh, I thought you raised your hand. I'm like, <laughs> Graham, Graham and Valencia. So Graham and Valencia, they like everybody. So you can go up and, and punch them, hit them, kick them, be mean to them. They're going to like you anyway. I tell you what, I'm not going to like you. I'll be real honest with you. I love you, and I will love you with Jesus. I will be at your deathbed praying for you. I will pray healing prayers upon you. I may not invite you to my party. I'm just going to be honest. That's just, I mean, you know, I actually really like the fact that Jesus called me to love everybody but not like everybody because sometimes I just don't click with everybody. And if we're honest, we all are sort of like that, except for Valencia and Graham because they like everybody. <laughs> But loving everybody can be difficult too, can't it? I mean, do any of y'all have people that it's difficult to love in your life? <laughs> okay, y'all have to share. Don't name names, especially if they're in this room. But love can be difficult. It can stretch us. And you know what? I think if we're not being stretched by the love of Jesus... We're probably not doing what we're called to do. Do you know what I mean by that? And we're called to love people that it's uncomfortable for us to love. If you just love everybody and you're just, you know, then maybe you're not around enough undesirable people. <laughs> we're called to stretch our love. We're called to love as Jesus loves. We're called to really push our boundaries. Because that's the kind of love that God's love is. God's love is boundless. He doesn't have boundaries. And that's awesome. And it's hard. But isn't it awesomely incredible that that love is extended to us? The hard part is then we are to offer that love to all people. And I hope that all of us here are stretched. Now, we know Graham and Valencia aren't, but the rest of us should be stretched. I want y'all to go hang out with some undesirables. And, you know, it, it may be me. You may think I'm undesirable. Come hang out with me. Everybody's undesirables are different. And you may find out that those people that you thought were one way and you didn't think you could, could love God will give you the love where you don't have it. And it will stretch who you are. And that's a good thing. Because in God's eyes, we're all horrible. And we're, he wants all of us to be a part of the kingdom of God. And just so you know, my mom has a job now. She's the general manager of a TV station in Midland. She had to go all the way to Midland to get one, but, you know, that's only the downside. 
We're all horrible. All of us. And that's what that parable is about, is God's love is for all of us.